some people trust the curriculum to take them where they need to go. Oh, I'll get a job at the end of my four years because I'm going to take this class and this class and this class, and it's like they build on each other. You should do so much work outside of class that you almost consider yourself self-taught. If, if you're in school, right. you should still be self-taught. Get what you want out of the curriculum. If you don't know who that is, that is Colin Levy, who is like, he's like one of the most successful blender artists, I guess, in the space. He's like the poster child of like, I don't know, everything an artist wants to achieve. So he, uh, well, he, he had humble beginnings. Like he was like, as a teenager, he was filming things with a camcorder and then he would put like blender stuff in the footage. Um, and then Ton Rusendahl saw that, the founder of Blender, and then hired him as the director of Sintel which in my opinion is still the best uh, Blender short film. So he directed that and then uh, got hired at Pixar. So he worked at Pixar for four years and uh, then he quit Pixar. He co-directed Agent 327, which in my opinion is the second best Blender <laughs> short film. Um, and now he's working on another short film called Skywatch, which he is funding and directing and just like He's been working on it for like three years. Um, I also worked on it for one year. So he came to me many years ago with the idea and I signed up, not realizing how much work it was. Um, but it is a hugely ambitious short film. So he talks all about that, the challenges he's faced with that. Um, also like how he got started in Blender and his advice for young people today who want to become a filmmaker or, or go their own path uh, within the industry. So uh, yeah, if that's you, I think you will really enjoy this interview. Uh, and I also think you will really enjoy Polygon, which is the texture library that I always wanted, which is why I founded it. So since creating it two years ago, Polygon has grown to over 3000 materials, HDRs, brushes, and now models. So if you want to start making better renders, sign up for a subscription and start downloading from the entire library. Without further ado though, let's get into that interview with Colin. Yeah, so Colin, were you always creative? Was I always creative? Um, I feel like everyone is born creative, you know? And then over time, it just gets rubbed out of some people. Uh, you know, like as a kid, you know, you're, you're just naturally, uh, you know, drawing and playing make-believe and, you know, imagining like a, a world that doesn't exist. But, you know, I, I feel like I, yeah, I was, I was a normal kid, but I was, I did a lot of drawing and uh, I think was influenced by like my grandfather and you know creativity in the family um, so I, I think that side of me was just nurtured but uh, yeah I mean I wasn't making films starting from the age of you know one but I was definitely like I don't know just I guess drawing and playing make-believe for sure yeah can you describe your first film yes I mean so I made a lot of like school projects that, that aren't exactly movies but they were still like, they got me behind a camera and like figuring out how to edit and put a little project together. Uh, and at the time, um, like, so, so I think the very first of these school projects was, uh, like I was probably 10 or 11, I think it's fifth grade. And uh, it was some like, yeah, rainforest project. And I went to the rainforest cafe, like, where I had eaten with my family before, and I just shot some of because the, it's a crazy restaurant experience. There's <laughs> there's sounds and there's like you know creatures, and so I shot it as if it was a, like a little documentary, like I was in the middle of the rainforest, nice. and put something together. I was editing basically straight to VHS, so I hit play on no way playback on the you know on the camera, and then would hit record on the VHS, and was just every shot was, you know, just wow. like tacking it on yeah. until I got to the end. And then I turned that in and, and we played it for the whole class and it was very, uh, a very fulfilling, you know, creative, like, you know, school experience because, uh, you know, I feel like that was the beginning of something. I was like, any excuse I got in school to do a video for a project, I would do it, even if it would be like 10 times more work. Huh. Uh, and that, that sort of probably, yeah, kind of where I got started. I mean, I was editing home videos and like, yeah, shooting my brother's birthday party and stuff like that for a yeah. while, just because I liked having a camera in my hands mm. and I liked reviewing what I shot and like uh, experimenting with editing. Like, 
wow, the same scene with this music, you know, feels completely different. Hmm. And uh, what is it like to have my bro brother blow out the candles in slow mo? Man, that's so cool. Right. Uh, you know, it's just yeah, these yeah. simple things that kind of get you started. But that was, uh, yeah, uh, probably from 10 to like 13 or 14, I was doing that stuff in an unfocused way. Mm -hmm. And then that's when I started, like, I discovered narrative and what's, you know, the possibilities of telling your own stories and mm -hmm. figuring out, you know, you can actually make a movie movie that's, like, entertaining and not just, you know, Thanksgiving dinner uh, because it's an occasion. <laughs> yeah. Was there a, a particular, how did you feel when, when people watched it? Like, was there something that was like, this is what people like? I mean, I definitely, um, one thing that draws me to film is that there isn't this li live component. You kind of slave away on a project for as long as you need, and then it's done. Mm -hmm. And it's only at that point, when you decide it's ready, that you bring it out to an audience <laughs> and get to hit play. But I was always just freaked out, and like, because uh, I played violin too growing up, like the live performance and like all this pressure and like that, I can't do that. Really, that's scary to me. Right. So um, I like the fact that you can just craft something in a, you know, in a cave and then bring it out, hit play, and you know what it is. And right. typically, I mean, yeah, I've had some pretty fulfilling, you know, movie watching experiences with, with an audience, you know, showing my work. Right. Uh, it's not actually something I enjoy very much still. You know, I'd rather just not watch it and like... No way! You know, I think I make stuff for myself more. I'm, I'm always just seeing, you know, the flaws of the thing. You know, you can't caveat everything and it's never perfect. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know... So I'm, you don't actually enjoy the process of showing somebody the film? Yeah, it's, a little it's weird. It's really weird. Really? Because okay. um, it should be fulfilling and satisfying. Hmm. It's like you work for such a long time and you want this to be what makes it like fulfilling. Hmm. And it's not, you know, someone watches it, even if they love it, it's like, yeah, good job, you know? And yeah. I, I, if you put too much weight or emphasis or like, you know, importance on that reaction, yeah. it's like, it can never live up to your expectations. Yeah. Like the fuel that, that gets me through a year, two years on a project is not, um, it, it is, it, there's a lot in there that's like self, you know, motivation, but what I've discovered is that if you're like, oh, people are gonna love it, people are gonna love it, that's what gets you through, right. then, then no matter how much people love it, yeah. <laughs> it's, not, it's not enough, you know? Right. So it's, it tends to be something that's like a slightly like, uh, I'm not gonna say disappointing, but it, it really grounds you. It's like, okay, yeah. Wow. I, I'd rather be moving on to the next thing once I finish. This has taken some time to figure out, Andrew. Wow. Like, yeah. like I've, been, I've done like dozens of short film projects and you know, these are, this is a, a psychological, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a psychological challenge to go from project to project and to be pushing yourself and to be a creative person making work mm -hmm. and um, so yes, these are some of the things I've figured out. Like I always need to be, I need to have another thing, otherwise I'm gonna fall into a, a slump, you know? I, I, I have to be focusing on, on the next. Right, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, of course, I'm proud of, of a lot of what I create and you know, bring into the world, and I like sharing it with people. Hmm. Uh, but it's, uh, it's definitely not, um, yeah, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't fill me up uh, with the you know creative energy to do the next thing as much as it once did. Right. It used okay. to all be about like I'm gonna show this to my parents and they're gonna be so proud of me. Right? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know? They're gonna say, "Oh, son." Yeah. <laughs> and that used to be what you know what I wanted. And and then after that, I think it was like I'm gonna post this on Blender Artists or I'm gonna yes. post this online. Yeah. And I'm gonna get a flood of comments and that's what fills me up. And uh, slowly but surely, it's been yeah this other motivations now, which is, I think, probably more healthy. It's less external validation, I think, these days. Yeah. It's probably good. Yeah, it's more of an adult sort of dream, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Career it's oriented. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's more about getting up those, you know, rungs of the, the ladder. ladder. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. 
it's interesting that you mention you know the social aspects because there's there's all this stuff you know no matter what you're doing you know for a career or for you know if you're pursuing a passion there's definitely always a social component and like the cool factor or like status you know like sometimes I wonder do I want to direct because it's the top of the pyramid do I want to direct because because that's how I get respect and I need respect or something like that. Yeah. And uh, I think it's good to ask those questions yeah. because yeah. Uh, that's just, that's not a good enough reason, you know. It's a human desire. Yeah. Yeah. We don't like to talk about it because it, it feels so like, I don't know, egotistical yeah. to say like, I want to be at the top or I want respect. Yeah. And yet, like I've done this a lot, like thinking about why do I want to make a good business or why do I want to have uh, you know, post something so cool online. Right. Yeah. If if all the people in the world suddenly vanished tomorrow, I would not be sitting in Blender <laughs> trying to make something right. cool. Yes. I do it for their reaction. And right. as egotistical as that sounds, I think yeah. that's the only reason any artist creates anything. It's true. I mean, I just said five minutes ago that it's all intrinsic now, and that I don't. <laughs> and yet, that's totally not true. Has, yeah, know. I think there has to be some. Of it. I, I don't know. Um, yeah. Yeah. I'm sure maybe some artists out there would, but. I guess so, maybe, hmm. but it's definitely, um, uh, I think, yeah, pretty fascinating to hmm. think about or analyze this, yeah. it's, but it is part of what makes us human, and I don't know, I feel like if uh, I didn't get some of the opportunities that I got, and uh, if, um, you know, if I hadn't uh, kind of come out of certain projects feeling a certain way, yeah. like, would I still be doing it? But I, I've gotten a lot of positive reinforcement from it. I've grown very confident, you know, in relation to my work. And so this is the path that I've found myself on. Mm. But I, I, and I enjoy it quite a bit. It's creatively fulfilling. Yes. Um, but at the same time, it's also been the thing that has stroked my ego the most. You know? <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, you know, I think it's, this is one of the uh, just challenges of being an artist is just maintaining uh, a healthy kind of overall outlook yeah. and uh, a healthy relationship with, to your work and to your audience, if that's uh, what it is. Mm. Yeah. So moving from from that, how did you end up at Pixar? I never know how to tell a story exactly because, you know, it's just like a lot of factors that kind of <laughs> led me. You might need that to be a filmmaker. <laughs> <laughs> right. I should, yeah, I should really be a better uh, storyteller. but. You know, ask me to make a film about it, and right. I can, oh. I'll, you know, no, no. that I can handle. Of course. <laughs> um, Sit in a dark room for three months. Right. You'll come up with well, something. Probably a couple of years. Let's be, <laughs> let's be real. This is me we're talking about. Um, yeah, I mean, I grew up interested in film and animation. I loved animation. Probably most of what I watched as a kid was animated. Mm -hmm. um, you know, just the 90s Disney classics and the early Pixar films. And I think when Monsters, Inc. came out, that was like, the, on the DVD, there was these special features that showed Pixar's new building at the time and, you know, Pete Docter. And there's literally, like, uh, I think an orangutan, like, just hanging out in the studio. People, like, you know, driving their scooters all around. And, like, they showed the cereal bar. And they, like, it was, like, crazy. And then they interviewed all these artists. And uh, it was the most incredible behind the scenes. And... Uh, also the most incredible movie. Like, Monsters, Inc. is still one of my favorite animated films ever. Um, I still am, like, in tears every time, you know, at the end. Uh, so it, it's, I think that's where the dream was born, you know? And I think it was, like, 15 at the time. Um, and that was around the time I discovered Blender. So I was definitely, um, you know, I had just, yeah, I had this, this dream that maybe one day I could, I could work at a, at a big studio. And of course, Pixar is the, was the best of the best. Yeah, top uh, of the pyramid. Mind. Yeah, exactly. There yeah. you go. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so um, I, I made movies. I, I, I made little animated projects. You know, I was learning to model and shade and light and composite. And I was just sort of following my intuition, I guess, like what, you know, whatever. Um, I was drawn to or the stories I put together like I just tried to go from project to project and yeah. best myself like get you know make every project bigger and better than the last and learn from it and um, uh, I mean I don't think I would have ended up at Pixar 
if it wasn't for Sintel. So I got to talk about Sintel. Of course. So, you know, that was... That what was is Sintel, great. first of all? Okay, yeah. so Sintel it was, is the third Blender Open Movie project that was made in Amsterdam by the Blender Animation Studio, um, headed up by Ton Rosendahl, uh, and Rosendahl. <laughs> <laughs> what? Uh, it, because of the two O's, I always pr pr used to pronounce it Rosendahl, <laughs> like an American. Right. Rose, Rosendahl. Rosendahl. Anyway. Okay. Um, yeah. So I still don't know how to spell it, but yeah. anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I think there are, two, are there two A's as well? I forget. I can never remember. <laughs> yeah. So I got the chance to meet Tom, um, who was also sort of an idol of mine at the uh, SIGGRAPH in mm -hmm. Boston, 2006, I believe. Wow. Yeah. So I was in high school, and um, I just finished a, 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 like a little backyard movie that, that I uh, used Blender for. That. The, the Suburban Plate is what it was called. Yes. It had these little CG, like, anteater, deer, things called Snurgles, you know, as a creature that I invented and designed and, and made in, in 3D. And I was very proud of it and I showed it to him and I think he was impressed probably because I was like tiny and like, you know, uh, yeah, pretty, pretty young to be doing, um, you know, work that I felt like looked pretty good. Yeah. And um, I think I made an impression then and then I, um, th I mean, years passed. And like I applied to be an artist on the second open movie project, which is Big Buck Bunny, mm -hmm. and uh, got to be on the wait list, but I didn't end up going. No way. And so like my career, I was starting to focus more and more on live action film. So I went to film school, went to Savannah College of Art and Design. Which um, state is that? That's in Georgia on the East Coast, um, in the South. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. Okay. And uh, it, you know, and that was a great experience, and I was pursuing animation and visual effects and film while I was there. But more and more, I just starting to gravitate towards film, you know, live action. Yeah. Uh, but then I got this opportunity to direct Sintel. Well, we didn't know what it was going to be, you know, the Durian Open Movie Project. And um, Describe, I, yeah, describe the conversation you had with Tom. Well, I wasn't vetted. This is what was crazy. It's like, this is still, you know, and will always be the most lucky kind of career moment of my life because uh, there was really, it made no sense to hand me the keys, you know, as director. I mean, because I was like 21, uh -huh. and um, yeah, I mean, I'd done some work in Blender, and I, yeah, I was interested in making movies. I guess he knew that, you know, at least my ambition was to direct, and uh, I had some Blender experience, but, you know, I was very inexperienced working on anything of any, like, level scale, you know, right. a team. Mm -hmm. Like, I've been doing everything on my own. Um, and there wasn't really a conversation. It was like, Colin, how would you like to direct? Do it in his voice. <laughs> <laughs> Can't. That is a voice. That is one impression I get. To you. <laughs> you would think that after a couple of years of working with him, I could uh, I would have developed this ability. So bad with impressions. But um, I, you know, it was a very exciting email because it was exactly what I wanted. Wow. You know, without even knowing it. Um, I was psyched. I knew what it meant, you know? Yeah. And my answer was, hell yeah, you know? So I was in the middle of my junior year when I got this email. At SCAD. At SCAD, yeah. I got this email, I forwarded it to my parents, and I ran around the dorm like no three times. Like, <laughs> kind of whooping and hollering, like really like pumped. And then I wrote my response. And um, so I moved to Amsterdam without knowing anything about the project, really. And, uh, and we figured it out, and I was there for a year. Yeah. And we had a budget of about a half a million dollars, ultimately, and a, and a team of um, between eight and 12 people. And we made this 15-minute um, hero's journey, like fantasy uh, film with about a girl and the, this bond that she, she has with the, a baby dragon that she finds injured and, and you know, um, kind of helps, you know, it recuperate and, um, and then when it's kind of taken, kidnapped away from her, she goes on a quest to, to save him. And I, I, it's, it's a tragedy and it's got a, a, a twist um, that I'm proud of and it, you know, it, uh, I feel like does all the things that as a filmmaker I 
try to do. I mean, there's, there's lots of a change about it, um, but with such a small team, I think um, I'm really pr proud of what we achieved. Uh, it's quite miraculous. Like, it's the most successful Blender film by a long shot, right? It depends what your your metrics are, but well, I, like yeah. it went vi like pretty viral, right? Yeah. Like amongst film, like people, because there's like I mean, you know, a lot of the Blender films are sort of tech demos. Right. The big but I'm sorry, that's really mean to say to the directors who made them. Well, they're designed to be. That's that's the thing. That's right. interesting, and that's like a pretty unique um, uh, reality. Mm -hmm. You know, at the Blender Institute, uh, it is to build the software. Yeah, yeah make like, better tools. Yeah, exactly. It's to promote Blender. It's to push its development. It's um, it really is to prove to the world that it's capable of you know kind of higher end CG. So you you know if yeah, Big Buck Bunny for example was all about you know uh, developing the the uh, the fur tools right, and yeah. um, Sintel for Fire. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I think that in the discussion early on on the project, that was Ton and, and then, you know, I was, we, we were butting heads a lot, I think, because, yeah, I'm happy to integrate some of these um, technical targets, but I really wanted to focus on the narrative, which um, really, it's true, I mean, uh, the first two um, films, I feel like, uh, were unique in a way, and like the first, you know, Elephant's Dream, wasn't going for a traditional uh, narrative. It was more of an experimental film. Um, right. yeah. But I, but you know, as a filmmaker myself, I definitely care about uh, telling a, a a cogent story that uh, can reach you emotionally. Yeah. And that's um, uh, I feel like Sintel sort of came out of that, you know, that tension, yes. uh, trying to do the both and I think uh, yeah I think it was it was better for it yeah definitely 100% yeah um, so like I, I I got through that sort of crucible experience right I was this is a hero's member. journey <laughs> <laughs> that's right yeah, yeah. Um, I, I was the youngest member of the team it was it was incredibly stressful like probably uh, yeah describe most... that like managing a, a team you're the youngest one on it. How was it? Yeah, uh, it took me a long time to come into my own, months and months. You know, to the detriment of the project, I would say. Uh, but part of that is related to the um, just the structure of how projects are run at that particular studio, uh, because Tom doesn't subscribe to the typical hierarchical structure of. Filmmaking, like like what is like typical yeah. um, in the industry. So like Don't director yeah. is not actually the top of the pyramid. Uh, <laughs> it's like you are one one among many, and it's very flat. And everyone has a say um, mm. in in ways that's like really problematic. Right. But you know, as someone who's inexperienced, uh, wasn't I wasn't able to m make much of a dent there. So I just found myself trying to steer the ship without really having the, uh, what do you call it? <laughs> the wheel? Yeah, without actually having the wheel. I was like... The pirate ship steering thing. Right. <laughs> <laughs> God. Yeah. Okay. That, yeah. So, you know, which is just sort of political and it's sort of, you know, you, you have conversations, you, you know. Um, I was friendly with, the, you know, everyone on the team, but... <clears throat> and I think that everyone was pretty collaborative collaborative by nature, so yeah, yeah. it ended up working out, and there are battles that needed to be fought, but it was definitely uh, a good lesson in, in the politics of, of filmmaking, and probably in most cases, mm -hmm. you know, there's always a lot of cooks in the kitchen, you know, if you have, um, you know, producers or creative entities, you know, executive producers, people who are giving you the money, there's, there's studio or distribution, like, there's requirements that are made of you as a creative lead of a project. Um, and certainly that's not, that's equally true at a place like Pixar, you know, there's like, uh, the director can, you know, try to put his vision on screen, but there's, there's lots of people to answer to at the same time, you know, yeah, yeah. you're trying to make a, a blockbuster four quadrant film, you know, that's, that, uh, in that case, the, you know, there's the Pixar brand, there's, you know, merchandising requirements, there's like, 
you know, it's it's like threading a needle. It's kind of crazy, right. actually. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, you know, it was released to a little bit of fanfare, as you mentioned. Uh, I was pretty excited to see. I was not at all expecting any of that um, positivity. At the, at the end, I was sort of like ashamed <laughs> of what I created or, you wow. know. Um, and, and I went back to film school. So I still had a year left. Wow. That was man. a big decision. I, I, like, I was sort of ready to like, get my career started yeah. as a director. Yeah. And, um, and that's when you made, what was the name of that film? Uh, the Secret Number was my, oh, right. my senior thesis project. What was the one before that, The Plane Crash? En route, yeah, which, okay. which I had shot just before leaving for Amsterdam for Sintel. So, oh, so you edited it in, right. okay. Well, like that. nights and weekends in Amsterdam. Yeah, as if directing one film wasn't enough. You're <laughs> like, know. let's do two. I did that this last time with Agent 327 as well, because <laughs> I had Skywatch. Yeah, okay, um, so then, yeah, and you got poached by Pixar for the Sintel? Um, well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't describe it that way because I had been applying to Pixar like sophomore year and junior year before Sintel even was a thing okay. and was rejected. Oh, yeah. and, then, uh, and then I went off and made Sintel, which, which um, ended up being a pretty good piece for my reel. Right. And it, but it wasn't like someone at Pixar saw that I directed this film and was like, oh my God. Get him on the phone. Yeah, right. <laughs> Did not happen. Uh, and I don't think it really does happen that way anymore. Okay. Um, <laughs> no, I just applied again, you know? It was like the third time I applied, but you know, my work had gotten definitely progressively better. Mm -hmm. I had gotten a phone interview a previous year, which was like a terrible phone interview. Describe it. I mean, I was just intimidated. I was just talking to like some of my idols, you know, like the DP of Ratatouille, the DP of the Incredibles, you know, this is in the layout department that I applied for, for okay. an internship. And um, I was just like, why, why, like, I'm wasting their time. I, that's the attitude that I came to it with. Yes. And, um, and they concluded the same? Oh, yeah. Well, it's like a self-fulfilling <laughs> prophecy, you know, in a way. Yes. Uh, but I was just so uh, uh, overwhelmed by the experience. It was, it, was, it was a great learning experience, but I, like, I knew when I hung up the phone, okay, there's no, no freaking way I'm getting this because, uh, uh, yeah, I was just so nervous. Um, yeah, and, um, understandable. Yeah, and, and then of course, like years later, these guys are my friends. Like I'm working with them. There's like the next office over. Do you, you ever know? sit down with your bowl of cereal at Pixar and go, hey, you remember, remember that, that? call? <laughs> <laughs> I bet they do. Because they, you know, in the, the, when I submitted my work after Sintel, you know, got on an interview again, and they were like, yeah, we remember, you know, they referred to some of the work that I submitted last time, so if they remember the work, they remember the interview. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's pretty embarrassing. And yet, they didn't um, box me into a corner or like, you know, write me off. Yeah. You know, they gave me another chance, and um, I'm really glad that they did. So uh, I got, uh, coming out of my senior year in film school, um, I had a, a residency uh, lined up Pixar in the layout department, uh, which was sort of a dream come true. And you know, even though I sort of env envisioned that I would move to LA and try to direct mm. Pixar, right. you know, and uh, I ended up being there for for five years um, before deciding that I actually do kind of want to resume that path. <laughs> <laughs> Can you describe your face the first time you walk through Pixar? Oh my gosh. It's amazing. Well, so when I, I moved out, like a few days, or like probably a week before, or half a week before my first day, and I drove by the campus and I was like looking inside, and um, uh, and then I tried to get in. <laughs> really? Like I drove up and I was talking to the security guard. I was like, so I, I start next week. I start on Monday. I just love to like just take a look. No, you know. <laughs> so I had to back up. It's like, okay, <laughs> so high security, you know, and then um, on Monday, I think I didn't get any sleep at all, you know, like, uh, and I drove in and found parking, and it was like, I think walking into the building, Lee Unkridge, director of Toy Story 3, walks past me, it's like, what? And then, of course, you go into the atrium, you know, and it's, uh, it's magical. It's what, what an incredible building, and yeah, what an incredible, right. incredible atmosphere, and, 
you know, Lego versions of Buzz and Woody are just greeting you at the door, and like, yeah, it's it's an incredible campus. It so is. it was kind of it looks uh, like the coolest exciting. place. Exciting, it's yeah, yeah. so exciting. <laughs> um, yeah, and then yeah, I, it was kind of a blur all that orientation week and, and whatnot. But I soon my, found myself in my department in layout, and yeah. it's just a bunch of amazing people just really really great people just overall and talented artists and uh, uh, found a home there you know um, and was lucky enough to work on I think seven projects by the end of it seven um, films seven films or I think there were four features what were they it's Monsters University Good Dinosaur Inside Out Finding Dory those are the features and there's Toy Story of Terror which is a 30 minute special yeah. on ABC. Which is great, by the way, if you guys haven't seen it. I thought it would just be like a little yeah. straight to commercial sort of little thing. It's great. I feel like it's they phenomenal. put just as much you know, time and effort and like attention to detail on that, yeah. if not more, because there was fewer shots to nitpick. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then, yeah, Lava, for which I, I served as a camera director of photography, and then Piper. Uh, the short before. No way! Uh, I didn't know you did Piper. Okay. Yeah. Well, I did, yeah, worked well, on it. For yeah, me. yeah, of course. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So like a, a broad range of projects, really exciting. Um, in um, a role that I really liked, and I think helped, you know, my craft. You know, my understanding of shot design for sure. Yeah, yeah. And um, it's really cool to see the process of how an animated film like that gets made, how a studio of that scale functions. Um, and uh, you know, made a lot of amazing friends, and um, yeah, I'm so grateful for that experience. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, it also brought me to California. So, <laughs> you know, after five and you're years, stuck here. I was like, it's sort of now or never. Like, either I'm going to stay here for the foreseeable future, and this is my career now, which is awesome, right? Or I should try and see. If I can, um, if if I can like make a directing career happen, right. and uh, uh, you know it's possible to work your way up an animation studio, and find yourself in the director's chair, um, but it's unlikely. You know, yeah. it, well, it just it's a it, it's an investment, a time investment. Right. It's a little bit. Of, it's like a decade long gamble, uh, just because yeah. of at least at a studio of that scale. You know, I I, I, I I'm not the guy who. You know, was directing shorts and made Sintel a viral hit and whatever. And, and, and found, like, I'm just a layered artist. And, you know, most of the people in my department haven't seen Sintel. It was just not, you know, I was just a new, fresh face. And my work was entirely whatever I produced within those walls. Yeah. Um, so, like, in terms of, um, you know, working your way up, you really have to. Yeah, you just have to prove yourself. And, you know, uh, I came in, at, I was 23. Uh, I feel like, you know, it, I, 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 uh, I, I will always wonder if it would have been possible because I would love to direct at an animation studio like that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, uh, it just seems like a little easier to take your career into your own hands, um, doing a little bit lower budget, like live action projects. Um, yeah. And yeah, we'll see. Yeah. I'm still I'm figuring it out right now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I just moved to LA, so that's <laughs> what I'm doing. What, like three days ago, was it? Well, I finally, literally this week, found like my permanent place, like you know where I'm right. going to be for at least the next six months. So, yes. but I've been bouncing around for a little bit. Yes. Um, so you left Pixar in what year? Last year, last May. Okay. Um, so 2016. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. I think so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He hasn't had a lot of sleep. Yeah. <laughs> May of 2016, and then, um, and then uh, I was not planning on moving to LA immediately or anything. I was just going to focus on my current passion project, which is a sci-fi uh, proof of concept short. Um, but then I got another opportunity from Tom to to help uh, in, to co-direct uh, another animated short in Amsterdam. So it was my second time moving and living in Amsterdam, working on an animated short. And How long were you there for? Eight months. Uh, were you really? I was a Agent 327, you were there for oh, eight months? Yeah, yeah, from September of 2016 to April of this year. 
I thought it was like a month or two. Oh no, man. Holy moly. It's crazy, yeah. I mean, that's what I was promised. It was gonna be a couple <laughs> months. I was supposed to get there in like September and like by November I should have been back. Yeah. But it, it went November, December, January, February, March, April. Whoa. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But again, another, another great film, honestly. I, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's exciting for, for different reasons. It looks and feels, I think, you know, uh, at a, uh, a modest like feature level. Like it's not Pixar DreamWorks, right. but it's definitely um, like visual quality wise, production value wise, um, it's, it's feature quality and it's an exciting genre, a little bit with a darker, more adult sort of edge. It's like, I think has real potential. Like I'm, I'm pretty excited about yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so yeah, I mean, we'll see where it goes. But it's it's designed. Tom to be is a, here right now, trying to yeah. make it make it an actual feature film. He is, yeah. yeah. So um, I'm crossing my fingers. Yeah. <laughs> I'm curious. Um, so like, some some place like Pixar, they would want to hire people that have uh, an ability. Um, to get on well with the team. Like a culture fit is, I imagine, very important. I think important. so, yeah, right. Do you know how somebody could convey that in an interview, or do you know what they look for? Yeah, it's a good question, because most of the time when they're looking at reels or portfolios, you're you looking no at idea. the, yeah, Solo the craft, the, yeah. the, 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 um, the technical side, and, um, or you know, your artistic ability, is, of course, as well. Um, I think that from the work that you've done in the past, they can probably infer. So, so if you're coming from a big studio already and you've been there for four years and you've worked on these different projects, probably you, you've, you know, you're already a, probably a culture fit for um, just the fact that you are in the industry and you kind of know how that whole deal works kind of thing. I feel like it's maybe a little harder for someone breaking in to the industry for the first time. Mm -hmm. um, also because you don't really know what to expect coming into an interview mm -hmm. uh, necessarily. Because yeah. those guys have already interviewed. They, they, they know how to play the game. Yeah. Um, but uh, I think it really probably does come down to the interview. And honestly, it's, it's, uh, it's just a feeling, right? It's just right. like, can you have a normal conversation and, and um, you know, right. a, a, an easygoing conversation. Are you friendly? Do you, uh, I don't know. It's like, I'm bad at small talk. Right. <laughs> Just chit chat, you know? Uh, but at the same time, you know, I'm passionate about stuff. Mm -hmm. Like I really do care about, I don't know. So like allowing your personality to, to come through, I think. and. Um, just doing your best. I think it's hard to tell, honestly. So, yeah. um, I, I don't know how to like advise yeah, yeah. people. It's like it's not. You no, there's not an make easy a answer. Good yeah. Impression, um, but there's not a huge amount of prep that you can do. Right. You know, um, if you're uh, a weirdo, it's not going to work. <laughs> I feel like if say. you can just talk about your work, uh -huh. you know that, that that's something that I'm actually. Uh, it's a crucial. Um, skill that I'm not so good at. I like to l let my work speak for itself, yeah, right? There you go. Because nice. it's it's all right there. Yeah. yeah. But uh, say so we don't need to do this important. interview. You've seen it. <laughs> it's also important to be able to talk about it and justify it yeah. and pitch mm -hmm. as well. I mean, this is a little bit separate, but like I have some movies I'm trying to get made, you know, or or soon will be. And part of that process is pitching, which I've never done before. Yeah. And it terrifies me. <laughs> because yeah, I you know, have right? to, I can't just go and prove that this is a good movie by making it. I need, someone, I need people to have faith in the project, like it, you know, see the potential, and essentially hand me bags of cash to go make it, right? Because yeah, yeah, yeah. movies are expensive. Yeah. So for that, I have to, I have to be able to talk about the work I want to do and be good about talking about the work I've done. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a lot of this sort of stuff that isn't the work itself, but is equally important yeah. around the work, which is being able to contextualize it, talk about it, um, and, and sway people one way or another about what you're doing. Mm -hmm. So 
I was asked a lot about Sintel during my interview, my first, my third mm -hmm. application to Pixar, right? Yeah. And um, that's why the interview went so much better than it did a year or two prior. It's because yeah. this is about a project I just worked on for a year. I can talk about that. Nice, yeah. You know, and, you know, obviously I'm excited about it. Yeah. So, um, I was responsible for most, if not all, of the camera work in Sintel. So that's what the conversation was focused on. And, um, you know, I was also pretty clear about how much I had to learn, how much I wanted to learn, how much I didn't know, some things I would change about it. You know, it wasn't all like, I'm the best. You know, a lot of it was just talking about the lessons I learned, you know? Right. And uh, I think that was probably a good tack, too, you know? Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, it's a while back now, so. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm curious about the, um, the feedback process. Um, there's, I don't know you call it a myth, but uh, some artists that haven't worked in the industry and they're just building their own portfolio or something like that, there's that saying that uh, too many chefs in the kitchen, mm. is that the one? Too many cooks in the kitchen, yeah. Too many cooks in the kitchen, yeah, yeah. yes. Uh, spoil the broth or whatever. Okay, is that what yeah, it is? Right. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but anyways, uh, is, uh, how important is, is feedback and critique? Crucial, incredibly, yeah. I mean, no matter what you're doing, I think. I, I don't know, if you're an artist producing work for yourself uh, and only yourself, um, then who cares, I guess. Mm -hmm. Like, if, if, if you don't want feedback, then I think that's completely fine. Mm -hmm. But if, uh, if you're trying to improve, uh, especially um, with sort of industry work in mind, or you're making a movie, I think for, because a lot of people have different views about filmmaking and critique, or, or um, like if you're making an independent film, you know, it's an, it's an indie thing already, uh, how much value do you put on like, uh, screenings or uh, audience tests, test previews, right? For me, I think it's crucial. You know, nice. I want to. I want to know how people receive my work before I put it out into, uh, into the world. Yeah. And if I have screenings of my work in progress, yeah. and get some feedback and discuss it, then I can react to it and hopefully improve some things that you know I wasn't aware of. Um, because you can't, you, like at a certain point, you just lose perspective. Right. You know, I think no matter what you're doing, a fresh voice will at least, um, you know, they'll see something that 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 you you can't because you're the one making it. Can you think of a time when that's happened? Someone's pointed something out that you did not spot, and it improved it. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's literally almost every day. A Any time I get feedback. Okay. Uh, which is very frequently, you know, I'm having my visual effects supervisor on Skywatch, Sandro, uh, critique my animation. He's not an animator, but he will point things out. It's like, oh yeah, you're right. You know, whatever it is. Uh, you have to find the voices who you trust. But um, certainly with writing, because I'm also, I'm writing some scripts right now, I'm really looking forward to putting this draft in the hands of, of some trusted readers to get some feedback. Mm. Um, but definitely, uh, it's also interesting how you yourself will suddenly see a bunch of flaws or issues with your own work when you're sitting next to someone who you're showing it to. No way. Yeah. Right. So, like, there's definitely been countless examples where, like, I'm having a, an internal check-in at Pixar, and, like, I've done all my work, I'm ready to show my supervisor, he comes in, sits next to me, I hit play, and I'm like, oh. And I'm like writing my own notes. I'm like, oh, <laughs> this isn't ready for you. Like, uh, wow. just because he's sitting there. Um, yeah. And I'm seeing it through his eyes, which forces more of a fresh, it's like, uh, I'm trying to experience it as someone who hasn't seen it before. Right. Sort of interesting. That is interesting. It just occurred to me, we haven't talked about Skywatch um, or where it's at. Yeah. So there was, uh, there was a little video that appeared on Blender Guru a few years ago. You and I awkwardly uh, sitting on a couch, yeah. talking about we need artists. Um, so you are making a sci-fi. So we need artists. Uh, <laughs> yeah, part two. <laughs> Keep applying. Yeah. Um, 
So you are making a sci-fi short film. Yep. That video was posted two years ago? At least. It's right. probably closer to three. Yeah, right? I don't know. Yeah. Um, so what happened since then? I worked on it for one year as the 3D lead, realized right. that I, I can't handle both Blender Guru, Polygon, and Skywatch, so I had to uh, bow out. Yeah. Um, but you're obviously continuing on with the... We're limping along without you. Yeah. <laughs> what, what, um, where, where, where is it right now? So we're uh, deep in post-production, and uh, you know, we have made a lot of um, good progress in the past six months. So it's been, it's been going very slowly since we shot the film in 2014. Like we'd had some you know, pickup shoots um, like a year later, um, but you know, I was balancing a full-time job Pixar, at yeah. Pixar, and then like I quit. That's part of the reason I left, to be honest, is like this movie, Skywatch, will never get done unless I make it my full-time priority. Right. Yeah. And then I go and make Agent 327. Oh yeah, that's <laughs> right. Like, and I was like, what are you doing? I know. <laughs> I only had like a couple months in between, you know, um, of, of focus. But since then, it's been great because I moved to LA and it has been my full-time focus and um, we also uh, have resources now because we raised a, a successful Kickstarter um, campaign and uh, that was incredible mm -hmm. um, and, and so finally we have both the time and the resources to get the visual effects done which is what's been yeah. so time consuming because we have just so many shots. Right. Um, How so, many shots out of the... Yeah, well like probably 90% no way, is it that some much? Visual effects. And most of them you're not going to notice. So it's like a 12 minute short. <laughs> it's eight minutes. Oh, eight and minutes. Two, and like 204 visual effects shots or something like that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, 90%. That's crazy. Yeah, because you shot it in front of a, a window and then there's like a fully CG building on the other side, right? Yeah, yeah. There's a, there's, so there's a few different categories of effects work. There's like the, the in your face stuff, which involves this uh, CG character, which is like uh, this drone, you know, which is a, a delivery drone, you know, which takes place in our future. We don't have a physical one, so they're all CG. Yeah. Um, then there's uh, uh, partially CG environments, like on the rooftop, we have a bunch of these delivery tubes. Um, so any the entire rooftop sequence, every shot where you see any of the environment, we're adding digital tubes, yes. uh, which is cool. Yeah. And set extensions, uh, which are kind of related to that, you know, where we have, we're shooting, um, we're trying to make the set look a little different than it was when we, when we shot it. So, you know, the rooftop we were on, the shape of the building has to be a certain way for it to make any sense. So we're adding wings to this building, for example. <laughs> we have stuff in the background like swarms of, you know, right, of, drones. Of drones. Can't um, even leave a bare sky untouched. Yeah, you know? we have this portal, which is a, a future uh, appliance, you know, where your deliveries come in uh, to your house. And, uh, and those are all CG. So, and, and these are just like, kind of like, it's set dressing. Yes, yeah. But CG, which yeah. is a little frustrating because right. it takes a lot of effort to make something kind of blurry in the background. <laughs> right. Sometimes. Um, did, but then there's like realize... paint fixes and little, little things um, that are, and UI for the computer screen, you know? Right. So, you know, it just adds up. <laughs> did you realize at the time how, how adventurous it was, or ambitious it was. Right, I never do, I never, <laughs> never quite realize. But the best, the best goals, I like that. Right? Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. I mean, I, I gotta get better at realistic assessment of the work to be done, yeah. you know? And I'm, I'm not the best at managing time either. <laughs> Fortunately, I have some people who are way better at that than me, you know, who are you know, involved in helping uh, push through it. Yeah. You know, we're, making, we're making some excellent progress um, so I'm really looking forward to being done with this thing. Um, <laughs> when, we, when can we expect it? Let's put it, let's announce a deadline. Oh yeah, well, I'm, I'm gonna say um, February or March. Nice, yeah. that's a still... few months away. Yeah, yeah, it's still, but it's, it's like still five months away or something. I was thinking the end of, the, end of next year. No, 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 
That's great. can't be that lit. Yeah. That's I have I have other projects that need to take. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, as soon as one finishes, you can't even have a day where you're not doing it. Right. <laughs> you're like, you gotta I think I'll let myself have one day. Yeah, okay, <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah. I'm excited though. It's it's the images we're we're making are, are looking great. I mean it's it's this film is sort of a product of like an earlier version of me. Like this is slow this is like stale. It's like three or four years stale and I'm feeling kind of insecure uh, about that. Yeah. But um, I think yeah, I'm pretty pretty excited on you know, on another level about just what we're what we've been able to achieve. Um, right. So yeah, very very curious how it's gonna be received. Yeah. How did it feel the the first time seeing your your work on the big screen? It just goes by so fast. Oh really? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, like there's my shot. Yeah, yeah well, I don't know. No, it's it's cool. It's definitely like I made a dent on this feature film that yeah. millions of people are seeing across the planet right yeah. now. And uh, it doesn't make or break the movie, yeah. but I know what I contributed to that. It's yeah. pretty exciting. The one I remember you told me, and I look for it, is uh, in Monsters University, uh, after they, spoiler alert, yeah. win the uh, cup, yeah. and then uh, <laughs> the, the two monster heads or something, right. and you put one of the characters, like the cheerleaders posing yeah, between right. his heads. <laughs> And then that, that made it in. I'm like, ah, that's cool. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Little, little tiny creative decisions like that kind of just pile up. I mean, that was an example I think I told you because I had a decision to make. Either I go home and get a good night's sleep and like, <laughs> you know, right now, or I execute this new idea I just had because I have a review tomorrow morning. Right. And the idea not, not only included that blocking choice, but it was a completely different camera move that involved combining a bunch of shots and it was like, kind of ambitious and I was like, man, do I really ha want to spend another hour on this? Right. But I stayed late, spent that hour, showed it in review, that was the favorite shot, you know, yeah. then Scanlon liked it, mm -hmm. and it ended up in the movie. Mm -hmm. And it was like, that was the most like direct correlation I saw between a decision I made and, and like impacting the movie in a, in a real fundamental way. Mm -hmm. It's like, because if I went home and had dinner, which probably, you know, I, I could have very easily justified, would be fine, the movie would be fine without it, but like, right. the movie would be different. Yeah. So that's pretty cool. Yeah. That's something that I, I don't have the, the patience for. <laughs> I, I don't know, I'm slowly realizing the patience to, uh, to see these long projects. It's like, uh. I don't know, I'm kind of worried my attention span is so low. Yeah. <laughs> Man. I, I, I know. Well, for me, I guess I've just gotten used to it over time. Yeah, right? It's like, something you learned. Yeah. But I'm hungry for faster, like, more nimble projects where I can do something in a weekend, put it out, be done with it. Uh, I feel like that would be more creatively satisfying mm -hmm. um, in, in a way. And so, yeah, uh, hopefully I can do sort of a mix. Definitely, like, commercial and music video work here. My sense is that that stuff moves pretty fast, so yeah, it's like it's the big passion projects of the feature films that you know mm. just go on and on. So yeah, but they're the ones that that make the biggest difference. Like there's this great book I was going to recommend to you, Deep Work. Okay. Um, but it's talking about how the majority of what we do during the day is shallow work. Yeah. It's answering emails. Yeah. It's tweeting. It's yeah. And there's so little time that we actually get to spend on Definitely. deep work. Yeah. And the deep work is the stuff that actually makes a difference in the world. And like this mm. book goes on to prove that like the biggest, most successful people of, you know, in history and of today, um, they don't tweet. They don't, even some of them don't even answer emails. Right. They don't have an email address. They got a note <laughs> on their thing saying, if you know, if you want to reach me, you know where to, right. but I'm not going to give you an email. <laughs> like, right. um, and it was fascinating, but uh, yeah, it was saying like it's that that deep work. That's the stuff that's hard to do. Yeah, right. and you've got to sort of be honest with yourself. Like it is difficult to sit down and get in the mode Definitely. to do it because you some and like what I've learned, I have to shut myself into my office for four hours. I set the timer, yeah. and I go, I can't leave here. I have a little program that turns off the internet, nice. blocks me out, and I sit there for four hours. That's amazing. Within about 20 minutes, I start typing. Otherwise, I'm just like uh, <laughs> throwing stuff at the wall. Right. But it, it, that's what you need to do nowadays. Yeah. Um, it's, I uh, struggle with that too. I right. always always have. Yeah. You know, um, the discipline side. Like I have it. 
I, you know, but, it, but it's, it's always hard and a struggle. Like, I want to do the work, and I tend to get stuff done, but really slowly yeah, and right. piecemeal, and, like, I need a lot of breaks, and, like, I end up on Facebook. And so, like, but this is a, it's a daily struggle for me, too. Um, Check out that book. It's yeah, great. that's a great idea. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, before you worked in the industry, is there anything you wish you could tell yourself? Well, one thing I think is sort of interesting is an observation I made. Um, the, uh, like when you're in animation school, if you're studying, typically you are encouraged to specialize uh, to a degree. Maybe you have your, your general kind of fundamentals or foundations kind of that you, you get through in your first year or whatever. Um, but you're told that to work at a big studio, you need to be very good at one thing. You know, you need to specialize and find your specialism and then find a job with, and that is how you get into a studio. Mm -hmm. But once you're there, your general understanding is so crucial mm -hmm. and underemphasized in education, I think. No way. So, uh, you know, if you are an incredible rigger and you get into the studio, then that's what you're going to be doing. And you have no ability, really, to do anything but rigging, because that's your, that's your specialty. Yeah. Um, but if, you, if you're that good at rigging and you have cloth skills and you know, you've experimented in Houdini you know, and, and like to do effects, or, uh, or you're good at life drawing, you know, or you not only do you build rigs, but you're an animator. That's a power combination because you know what the animators want, you know, because you're building tools for the animator to use. Like suddenly you just become, um, there's just a lot more options uh, right. that, that there's uh, not just for career mobility reasons where you can just jump around, but your understanding of the whole, you can see the whole, you know, the big picture of how these puzzle pieces come together because you've done those things. Mm. Um, it's similar to how I feel about a director, you know, for live action should be able to do all these things. They should have some production design experience. They should know how to operate a camera. They should have taken acting classes and, and understand what it's like to play all these different roles. And um, so I, I think that applies also to, to studio work and animation, visual effects. Mm. And for me, I think it, um, it was really valuable, yeah, that I felt like, I felt like my animation skills really helped me as a layout artist. Right. I feel like my lighting skills helped me as a layout artist. Mm -hmm. I feel like my storytelling skills, my screenwriting helped me as a layout artist, as did my ability to draw. Like, everything actually does help even, within, even though you're kind of told to um, mm -hmm. specialize. I think that's that's a that's a like totally true, yeah. and I think a lot of students are getting the wrong advice. Yeah. Um, and I, th I think even that that quote that people say, "Jack of all trades, right, master of none," right. I think I learned recently that that has been misremembered. Yeah. Like the full quote is, "Jack of all trades, master of ma what? What is it? <laughs> what? Uh. Jack of all trades, master of none is better than a, a master of one." What? No. I know. That's what I've heard. I some, Google it. Yeah. <laughs> but I think, yeah. yeah, I'm pretty sure um, that's, but yeah, um, another guy, Scott Adams, the guy yeah. who made Dilbert, he calls it um, skill stacking. He says he's not the best artist. He's not the best comedian. Yeah. He's not the best marketer. He's not the best writer. Right. But he's adequate in all those things and stack yeah. them up together. Yeah. And you become something. Yeah. And I think it's so, so important, as you, as you mentioned. Totally, totally. I mean, I, I definitely was under no delusion. Like, there's so many people who want to work at Pixar, right? I mean, it's, yeah. it's, it's so competitive. Do you know how many applications they get? No idea. Okay. <laughs> but I definitely, um, you know, for a while was feeling, well, there's imposter syndrome, which you kind of get over after a while. Uh, oh, what's that? Where you just feel like, they made a mistake and they haven't discovered it yet. Like, I'm not supposed to be here. I'm an oh. imposter. You know, <laughs> right. Like, I don't deserve to be here. Okay. But also, it's like, 
on a realistic level, I know uh, that like I'm not the best person for this job on the planet. There's no way. Like I'm not the best layer artist or or whatever it is, filmmaker. Um, but there are a lot of factors, and yeah, exactly what you say. Like I'm good enough, and I'm still striving to get better. You know, so I'm growing, I'm learning, I'm trying to be my, the best that I can be, and I have all these other skills to bring to bear as well. And you know. I can work well with others, and I'm, you know, there's, there's, the the whole the complete picture, um, is, uh, you know, just as important as how great am I at this one thing? So, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, uh, I I I definitely uh, was sort of surprised um, to discover this sort of like, you know, this. And definitely, like it depends. If you're if you're working in a big studio, uh, specializing makes more sense. And I'm sure that you know people are pretty familiar with the notion that if you're working at a smaller studio, or you want more creative control. Um, you know, a smaller place will give you uh, more flexibility to kind of uh, flex some muscles in multiple areas. You know, you could be a story artist and an animator and um, you know, and light and shade and whatever, you know, whatever your skills are, you're more likely to be able to take advantage of all of them uh, at, a, at a smaller place, mm -hmm. um, yeah. which is, which is really fulfilling, you know, in a, in a way that maybe doing the one thing over and over every day isn't. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Say someone out there, they're into Blender or they're into, I don't know, any software, yeah. they're a beginner and they've got their eyes set on Pixar. They want to work at Pixar. Yeah. And uh, if you could give them a training regime for 12 months, what would that look like? So what, where are they right now? You said they're a beginner? Yeah, I don't know, at the sort of beginner stage. They understand the software. What department are they interested in? Let's just say 3D generalist. <laughs> the most difficult, but the one everyone evidently chooses. I mean, because, sure. I think as a 3D generalist, you're not going to find yourself at Pixar until you find the one thing you're good enough at. Mm. This, you know, this goes back to the same question. It's like, do you want to specialize and how much do you want to? Okay. So like, you have to have a bare minimum. Like, one of the things that you are doing as a 3D journalist, you have to be world class at to get to gotcha. a big studio like that. And that's the department you'll find yourself in. And that kind of defines your whole existence at a big studio like that. Yeah, right. However, I'm saying that also that these other skills will help you right. do your job well yeah. um, in that specialty. Yes, gotcha. But I would say um, like the more goal oriented you can be, the better. So okay. if you know you want to work at Pixar, work towards working in a particular department, you know, and specialize with an understanding of, of the whole. And don't cut out different parts of the process in order to uh, just do one, one, you know, one thing. Um, essentially, I would say become a well-rounded 3D journalist and then specialize. Maybe that's the gotcha. Way to, gotcha. Know. Okay. So um, I, I think working on projects, okay. um, like bigger projects, are uh, is is really a good way to go. Certainly, mm -hmm. like when there's recruiters visiting film schools or animation schools. Um, it makes an impression when you've worked on a bunch of senior projects or you're working in a team together on something. Um, okay, so the, a team? Something with yeah, a team? Yeah, okay. creating images that are not exercises. Okay, so finished image. Yeah, that tells a story, this narrative, this, mm. this artistically am ambitious. Okay. It's, it's um, no one wants to see a really well rendered, you know, um, uh, like it's hard to come up with an example. Like, I'm just trying to think of the most stereotypical. Yeah, but again, like I was thinking cube, you know, in a reflective. <laughs> but that's not doesn't show any work. Like right. you can do a lot of work on an image that's not uh, worthy of it. Right. You know? Oh yeah, totally. Um, yeah. I think that like if you can put some of your own voice into what images you're creating, um, you know, instead of creating a a stock you know, character that you've seen a million times, 
um, something that a little bit more unique, you know, it goes a long way. But again, it's like instead of a T pose, obviously, that's where you need to start. But if you're able to take a character and put her in an environment and light it and, and have the whole um, be an image that, like, uh, again, it's like I'm focusing on right now uh, someone who's creating a still image rather than a movie. Um, but it, if that one image can tell a story, if that can feel cinematic, if it if it's some if it if it's not a huge leap to say, well, I could be in a movie, you know, or I want to see more of that, you know, that's that's a good place to start. Hmm. But certainly, um, if if you can be working with people on a collaborative project, um, especially if it's a, a narrative short film, it's it, that goes a long way. Right. Yeah. yeah. Definitely. Um, I definitely would suggest to anyone who is pursuing this in school to not let the school dictate what you're learning. Okay. This is really crucial. How do you in mean? my opinion? Like some people trust the curriculum to take them where they need to go. Oh, I'll get a job at the end of my four years because I'm gonna take this class and this class and this class and it's like they build on each other and Right. No. That's like the bare minimum. Like and, and like these assignments, everyone coming out of the school is going to have a portfolio of the same assignments. The work looks relatively identical to each other. And it's not great. No. Yeah. It's like if you want to do this for a living, you should do so much work outside of class that you almost consider yourself self-taught. If, if you're in school, right. you should still be self-taught. Get what you want out of the curriculum, yeah. you know, and take advantage of the time and the resources and the people, and you know, um, you know, blow everyone else out of the water. That's yeah. like the, <laughs> your competition is not your class. Yeah, it's everyone. It's mm. the world, <laughs> yeah. you know, which is uh, scary. It's very yeah. intimidating. Yeah. Um, but what was it like at SCAD? What What would you say? Um, the the number of students that did go above and beyond versus the number of people that stuck to the bare minimum. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty slim pickings. I mean, it's really just a small handful. Yeah. And those are the ones who ended up, you know, working at Blue Sky and, you know, Rhythm and Hughes and, you know, and Pixar. Um, yeah. I was sort of surprised by how much apathy there <laughs> was, yeah. you know, in school where everyone is, I thought, you know, here to, you know, be, to work in animation right. or, or film, yeah. which is interesting, but... That could be that, the that, schooling background, like people are like, got to do this assignment to get an A, yeah. and it's like once it's filled, check that box, Right. but they don't understand the, There's a relationship. the bar. Right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah totally. Yeah. So, but it, I mean, it depends why you're going to school and like what, what you're, you know. And when you say school, like uni, like secondary. Right. Like university. Yeah, and not everyone can afford uh, or, you know, uh, is on that track, you know, to go to a, a university that specializes in film or animation. I, I think it's completely um, optional. I mean, to get, to get good enough, you don't need to, to go to any of these schools. Um, Animation Mentor, I think, for example, does a much better job of training animators for the industry than most animation programs at a four-year university, you know, right. and it's cheaper. Right. So there's definitely alternatives and, and ways to, uh, to hone your craft. Um, but I do think the, the most uh, important thing is putting in the hours and um, trying to push yourself. and. Um, the nice thing about going to a film school or animation school, if, if someone's um, considering that as a path, is more about the people you meet, you know, and the friends you make, and the connections that will unexpectedly be meaningful, you know, after school. Right. Um, yeah. Which happens all the time, and I think right now in my current like life situation, it's really coming becoming clear to me just how many 
like I feel like I have friends in LA and they're all mostly SCAD people who I went to school with six or seven years ago. Yeah, yeah. right. And the people on, that worked on your film at the moment mm -hmm. are from SCAD. Yep, yep. Yeah, so, which is crazy. And at the time, I didn't really value those relationships quite as much as I probably should have. Mm -hmm. You know, I was just thinking about the project, the individual project. I need to get this one thing done. Yeah. But in the pursuit of that, I made some lifelong friends who I'm still working with. Yeah, right. Um, so uh, that, that's the, the reason why you know, going to school for this stuff is, is also is not a bad idea, you know, yeah. but you just have to supplement what you're taught with um, uh, your own study, yeah. basically. Yeah, definitely. What, what, if you had like two artists, right, yeah. and they're at the age of going to, thinking about going sure. to school, whatever it is, what, what sort of personality traits would you, would you look at to guess which one is going to be a success. Interesting. Um, I would just say your determination. Determination? Yeah, maybe. Um, because I do firmly believe, you know, like, the, the one thing that's the separating the people who make it from the people who don't is the people who don't, at some point, they give up. But if you just keep going, <laughs> like ninety percent of it right. is, yeah. But I don't know. I mean, I could answer that question so many different ways. But I say that partially because I'm trying to tell myself not to give up right now. <laughs> it's like I want to yeah. get somewhere, yeah. and um, I'm not there yet, you know. Uh -huh. And uh, I, I hope that someday I will be. And I, I want to just, I want to believe that by continuing along this path, you know, and chipping away at it, that something, you know, exciting is, is going to come to fruition. Yeah. It, but it's, uh, it's, it takes a lot of faith and a lot of effort, you know, and nothing just gets handed to you on a silver platter, so you got to really work right. for it. You're very, yeah. s like, i got to figure this out. Right. Right. Yeah, you got to, you got to, so determination, but also, you know, um, that's just like, that's half of it, I guess. It's yeah. like the other half is like the... Determination should lead Diligence you to the, wanting to right. be a self-starter. Yeah. 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 Totally. Yeah. Mm. The discipline is, even though I just said, you know, I struggle with it. Like I'm on Facebook, I'm like procrastinating. I'm doing everything except what I'm supposed to be doing sometimes. <laughs> yeah. um, if, you can, if you can be making some sort of daily progress on the deep work, right. you know, I think that's, uh, that's crucial as yeah. well. Yeah. You know? I definitely, I mean, I was not, in college I was just, I was working all the time. I didn't really have a college experience, you know. I didn't go to parties. I wasn't very social. I was in front of my computer in 3D or working on my movie projects. And like, do I regret that? Mm. Mm, yeah, partially somewhat. But I also feel like that's what got me where I have gone. That's, I don't think I would be... I don't, I don't think I would have worked at Pixar, or got this Intel experience, uh, you know, opportunity if I, if I wasn't sort of wired to just be working and improving and putting in all, all those hours, you yeah, know. Right. So I don't know. Like you can, you know, I wouldn't recommend like sacrificing your life, personal life, for like yeah. ideally you find a balance, but it definitely, yes. um, you know, there's a relationship there. Yeah. Between the the, just the your, you know, work, work ethic and like, you know, your habits, I guess. Yeah, it's like, it's like a catch-22. It's like there's, there's so many times when you think like, what, how did I end, how did I get myself into this mess? Yeah. And like, I'm like stressed out of my mind. I can't fall asleep. I can't sit down without a resting heart rate of anything <laughs> over 90, yeah. you know. Oh, maybe I just need to chill out, and then it's like, but that's what. <laughs> right. <laughs> that's yeah. the contributing force totally. to success. So it's infuriating. Like it my is. anxiety is something I'm trying to, like I, I don't want in my life, yeah, right. and yet it's the anxiety that gets me, you know, yeah. to do crap. So yeah, I I know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're both struggling with it right yeah, now. Yeah, it's so funny. Yeah, yeah. 
It's great, though. I mean, mm. this is uh, this is like the big challenge. As I don't know, a creator, an artist, an entrepreneur, entrepreneur. It's it's um, yeah, it's 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 part of the journey. You yeah. know, yeah. I feel like I'm I'm getting better. You know, about the life work balance and the anxiety. You know, but every every month, you know, I feel a little bit different. So it's, yeah, right, it goes up and down. Keep, yeah, and it takes constant like maintenance and modulation. Yeah, <laughs> I was I was feeling some anxiety this morning when my uh, <laughs> guest didn't show up. Right. Yeah. This yeah. Is, uh... For the folks who don't know, I uh, <laughs> Colin saved me here. We had this whole thing set up, and then uh, yeah, couldn't get the person we needed to interview. I was sleeping in. I got a text <laughs> from from Andrew. I was he was like, "Can you be here?" You yeah. Know? Yeah. Here. We got to do this thing. <laughs> We've paid for the space. <laughs> Would you have any advice, we sort of touched on it, to your 18-year-old self? <laughs> I mean, for, for the most part, I feel like looking back, I've, uh, you know, I, I feel very lucky. Things have kind of worked out, you know, in, in, a, in a way that I, like, I don't think I took any, like, definitely wrong turns, you know? I, I, um, I do feel like I did sacrifice a lot on the personal side, on the, you know, and maybe I would say to, you know, just like work on that a little bit more. But I feel like, uh, you know, which is not what you're going for. But as like my 18-year-old self um, was was very single-minded, you know, mm-hmm. and, and I kind of uh, uh, missed out on some life experiences. Okay, you know, yeah. I would say, yeah, yeah. Uh, which is like again totally not in the, you know. Yeah, I get it. But um, I would say the thing that changed me the most about my Pixar time was my level of confidence and um, gaining a lot of, uh, I would say, friends more than connections. Mm -hmm. Like building um, a community of people who I know who are doing great work and uh, doing inspiring things and uh, who are just good people too, who, who I like to hang out with. And that's like... You know, it was never my focus, you know, but I'm realizing how great it is to to have friends who are doing it and how inspiring that is and how um, and how it relates to to confidence, you know, becoming more confident. Is that is that what you meant? Yeah, right. I mean, believing that I can really do it and uh, that I'm not an imposter. Right. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah. Um, feeling wor- worthy of 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 the opportunities that I've been given, you know, I think even throughout Sintel, I was like, you know, uh, I, I knew that I wanted to direct, I was doing my best, and I, I really liked it, and at the same time, I felt, uh, you know, somehow like I didn't deserve it, you know, in, in a weird way, um, and uh, it's, it's, I don't know, it's, just sort, it's sort of strange, it's like a, you know, identity issue, I guess. Yeah. But. Uh, uh, it's like I would just say growing into a new shoe, you know, go up, up a size. It's like it take, takes right. time. Yeah. yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I would just say have confidence that it's it's gonna work out, you know, and that and uh, you know I think that uh, I was very impatient, very very impatient. I wanted my future now, you know, as an eighteen year old, <laughs> yeah. and like now I'm like almost thirty. And I haven't achieved all these goals that I had for you know what that was going to be. And like at the time, I like I had some momentum. Like, you know, uh, directing Sintel at 21 is pretty. You know, it's like wow, it's like fresh kid off a block, like up and comer. Yeah, know? yeah, <laughs> new challenger. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, I don't have that that anymore, mm-hmm. and I'm glad because like now um, I can just do things right at the right pace and like develop it, you know, uh, without this sense of urgency. And I guess I have more faith that it's, it's going to work out. And, yeah. and that, you know, it takes time to, to gain that confidence, um, especially because you do need this, um, all, all these, like, indicators from, you know, external validation and, and all that. Um, yeah. You know, it, it helps to have had a bunch of projects um, come out and, you know, do fairly well. Um, yeah. But... Um, Definitely, I, you know, I would just say sort of keep at it, you know, just keep going and do what you do and like, 
you know, it's all going to pay off. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> well, we will see with uh, Skywatch. Yeah, I guess we'll see. In March? Yeah, next time you interview me, I'm going to be homeless and like... <laughs> Living under a bridge. Yeah, right. Here's Colin Levy. <laughs> what did you say it didn't. Time? It didn't work out. It didn't pay off. I need a job. Uh, yeah. Awesome. Um, well, great to talk with you. Yeah, man. Yeah. Glad to be here. Thanks for having yeah. me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> cool. This is good.